Bienvenidos, and greetings to our virtual audience joining us from across the country, and to all of you right here in sunny Miami, Florida. Welcome to the 2022 Hased Leadership Pipeline. Our program is brought to you by our generous sponsors, including our host sponsors, PepsiCo and Target. Now, welcome to the stage, the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibilities, President and CEO, Sid Wilson. Buenos dias, mi gente. Buenos dias. It's good to see everybody here. Welcome to Miami, Florida. For those of us that are here, and for those many that are watching virtually, thank you so much for joining us for our 2022 Hacer Leadership Pipeline Program. Give yourselves a big applause for being here. How was last night? Wasn't it awesome? Yeah. Uh, again, it was, a, it was a great reception. Hope everyone can, continues to network with each other. And make sure that you're sharing your experiences on social media. And when you do, just make sure you use that hashtag, H-A-C-R-L-P-P-22. H-A-C-R-L-P-P-22. Let's, let's let the whole world know. And for those that are watching virtually, share your experiences virtually as well, because our virtual uh, attendees will also be participating. And throughout these next two days, um, you'll, be get, you'll get a chance to ask questions of the panelists, and so will those virtually as well. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're so excited for you, because as I shared last night, um, the Asset Leadership Pipeline Program is all about you. And what can you do uh, to rise up the ladder within your companies? Every single one of you that is here, you're here because you're the chosen ones at your companies who, uh, who are here as opportunities to move up the ladder. So we're so excited for all of you that are here and for the many that are, that are here virtually. Um, our Hacer Leadership Pipeline program, as with all of our programs at Hacer, are made possible uh, thanks to our sponsors. And we're so thankful to our two co-host sponsors, PepsiCo and Target. Give our co-host sponsors a big applause and thank you for being co-host sponsors. You know, we have a, um, a, a, a great lineup today and uh, tomorrow, we encourage you to uh, participate and listen closely because we have some great topics um, that I think are going to be uh, incredibly helpful and supportive as you think about your pipeline uh, up the corporate ladders at, at your companies. Um, we'll be discussing um, branding, which will be coming up next after uh, as our kickoff session, um, ERGs, when you're the only one in the room, which I can tell you that uh, many of us have had that experience. I know I have as an Afro-Latino um, being in these rooms, um, and also just thinking about your overall strategy. So we're super excited for, for, uh, for just the many sessions today and tomorrow. We have a great luncheon speaker uh, today. You don't want to miss David Ruiz. Um, his, his, uh, his story is absolutely incredible. So we're looking forward to that. So um, let me, let me um, also just, uh, again, thank also our virtual attendees, we have hundreds of people that are watching virtually from, the, from coast to coast. Uh, so, hello, mi gente, <laughs> you know, so who are watching virtually. Um, and, and lastly, you know, I encourage everyone just to continue to network with each other. It's, you know, you know this is, it's great to be back in person. Um, it's our first leadership pipeline program in two years, and uh, we're really excited to, you know, to be together, uh, continue to share, um, whether it's on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, you know, all the social media posts, share business cards too, and that's old fashioned, but we still do business cards too. <laughs> so, um, so those are some great examples. So with that, Let's get started. I, I want to uh, bring up uh, representing uh, our first co-host sponsor, PepsiCo. She is the Vice President of Sales, and please welcome Anita Price. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sid. And it is such an honor and privilege to be here today representing PepsiCo and being able to kick off this ACER event today. So I hope all, all of you are doing really well. 
Let me start by saying that as the largest food beverage company in the world, diversity is a business imperative for PepsiCo. Diversity and inclusion has been part of our DNA all the way back to our first black sales team in 1947 and the legacy of Harvey C. Russell. We believe we have a responsibility and unique opportunity to help address societal challenges and take steps together to advance a more united, equitable, and inclusive workplace and world. As part of this recognition in 2020, PepsiCo launched or more than 570 million racial equality journey over the next five years with focus on three key pillars, people, business, and communities. For people, we are focusing on increasing our black and Hispanic representation at PepsiCo through recruitment, education, internship, and apprenticeship. And I'm delighted to report that our progress in 2020 has increased or Hispanic manager representations um, to a 9.5%. For businesses, we're leveraging our scale and influence across suppliers and strategic partners to increase black and Hispanic representation and elevate diverse voices. That includes um, over the last year and a half, we have supported 500 plus Hispanic owned business through Juntos Crecemos platform and dispersed 2.5 million in funding across 250 businesses impacted by pandemic in the US by mentoring, coaching, and business support. And on top of that, we have spent over 250 million with our Hispanic suppliers. And in the community, we're working to drive long-term change by addressing systemic barriers to economic opportunities and vaccine economic empowerment for black and Hispanic Americans. And this includes awarding over 2,000 scholarships through PepsiCo Foundation Community College Scholarship Program. This initiative represents a holistic effort for PepsiCo to walk the talk of a leading corporation and help address the need for systemic change. Now, let's roll the video. In 2020, we launched our Racial Equality Journey Hispanic Initiative, a more than $172 million set of commitments over five years to uplift Hispanic communities and businesses and increase Hispanic representation within PepsiCo while helping to dismantle longstanding racial barriers. Year two in our five-year journey and we're proud of the progress we have made across people, businesses, and communities. For our people, we increased our Hispanic managerial representation to 9.6% and added 31 more Hispanic associates to our executive ranks. For businesses, our JEFA-owned campaign celebrated Latina-owned small business owners, elevating their economic impact and valuable contributions to communities far and wide. As we commemorate 40 years of our supplier diversity program, we're proud that we have spent more than $250 million with Hispanic suppliers in 2021. And for our communities, we expanded the reach of our community college scholarship program from 11 cities to 20 cities across the U.S. And I'm so honored to actually inform you that you have been selected as one of our PepsiCo Foundation Smile Scholarship recipients this year. Seriously? Through our SMILE program in our second year, we awarded 25 scholarships for students transitioning from two-year to four-year colleges and universities. And finally, our Team of Champions program, which supports Hispanic and Black youth gain access to the game of soccer, supported 19,000 athletes and coaches across the U.S. and helped 20 student athletes through the Access U Recruiting Mentorship Program, helping to build the next generation of scholar athletes. Our progress is made possible by our associates who passionately work to deliver against our goals. We're committed to continue this journey and catalyze positive change for our people, business partners, and communities. All right. Thank you again, PepsiCo. And now please see our video from our second co-host sponsor, Target Corporation. We are never done. 
Never done seeing, never done building, never done listening to that little voice inside your head that says there is always something more to do and we are always better when we do it. Nah, we're never done. In fact, right now, we do more. We do the work of opening eyes wider to see difference as strength, opening paths forward to lift diverse talent, and of doing the essential work of not just cracking a door, but breaking down a wall to let all humanity in. We mean the kind of humanity that's made up of all humans. Because when we let more voices in, we lift each other up, creating a place where all people are not just asked to the table, they're heard at the table. Let's do all of that and more to realize the power of community and redefine what our job really is. A purpose shared, a promise kept, and a true reflection of the people that we love to serve every single day. Ready? Let's go. Please welcome to the stage, Hacer's Vice President of Strategic Engagements and Initiatives, Jai Vargas. Buenos dias, mi gente. Hey, Gabe. How is everyone? It's so wonderful to be here. Welcome to our session. I'm delighted to have you all. I'm going to be focusing on your executive brand today. In just a few moments, we are going to start taking initiative and making sure that we are absolutely in control of what we're planning for our career advancement. Today's session is going to help you understand how to leverage your authenticity, your culture, your traditions, and your language. And making sure that when you meet someone in a location like this for networking opportunities, you can engage with them in the most authentic way. So that they don't ever find you in person and say, wow, this person like Gabe is incredible from Chevron. But then when they look you up on LinkedIn, they're like, is this the same person? Right? You want to make sure that everything that you're presenting in person comes across in the most genuine, authentic, and real way. I'm going to begin my presentation, and I want to have you focus on engaging over the next two days with your colleagues and with others that you could possibly share some resources with. As most of you know, I am known as the LinkedIn Ninja. I have been on LinkedIn for 17 years. And so it's one of those things that we know is important to have, but perhaps we don't spend enough time focusing on it. You see, our personal and professional brand has everything to do with the way in which we advance our careers. Our agenda for today is going to have something to do with your authenticity, but everything to do with your genuine need and want to connect with others. I'm gonna share with you called, something called unique value proposition. Yes, traeme más café. <laughs> Making sure that you're acknowledging and reviewing all of the accomplishments that you've had thus far in your career and how to combine that to telling your story when you're at a networking event like this one. I'm going to share with you some challenging limiting beliefs that I experienced growing up in corporate America as a Latina, as an immigrant from Dominican Republic. Where are my Dominicanos? Yes, yes, my people are always here. I love it, I love it. And making sure that when someone asks you, so what do you do? You don't just say the company and the title, but you really engage in a deep and meaningful conversation about what you do for the community and why what you're doing right now for your organization inspires you, and why you're passionate about making sure that other people that look like us come into this space with your help. We wanna begin by understanding your unique value proposition. What is it that you have inside you that makes you special, unique? How can we leverage what we hold internally, our skill sets, our characteristics, to be able to set ourselves apart from the competition, right? Making sure that if you're sitting amongst a room full of other attorneys or accountants or sales managers, that you can raise your hand and confidently say, yes, we share the same experience and skill sets, but this is what makes me unique and different. And so I know that a lot of you are taking notes on your notebooks. Make sure that you're writing down for yourself. 
What are some of the ways that it makes me unique and different? How do I share value? How to bring input? Am I incredibly resourceful? How do I improve a situation? And why they should work with you and nobody else? That's your unique value proposition. Let's really hone in on those certain aspects of our brand. For me, it was actually simple. I was actually in college when I started to understand what my unique value proposition was. And it was something as simple as being bilingual, being able to speak Spanish, and also learning Portuguese. Making sure that every single opportunity that I had, they knew that I was the Hispanic and Latinx market expert. This is the first example in how you can articulate your unique value proposition. I want to see a hands, a hands up for those of you who know how to code or understand these coding languages. How many of you know Java, Python, JavaScript? All right, I'm counting about seven of you. That's your unique value proposition. Perhaps you don't use those skill sets or those resources in your current role, but it's something that you have that obviously, as you can see, is setting you apart from the rest. And so this is a way that you can make sure to let others know of this particular skill set. Hey, everyone. My name is Gabriel from Chevron. And as you may know, I've been using my skill set and my capabilities on programming. I'm well versed in Java, JavaScript, and Python. And I use these technologies and capabilities to my advantage in my role. If anyone ever needs my support in this, you can count on me, right? Making sure that people don't just understand what department and title you hold, but what skill sets and resources you have unique to you. There's about 200 individuals here, and I only counted about seven of you who know how to code. That's your unique value proposition. Another one that a lot of you can share is one that talks about your language skills. Right? Being able to say, hello, everyone. My name is Lucinda or Gabriela. Given the fact that I'm fluent in English and Spanish and Portuguese, it allows me to communicate across our various regions effortlessly. It's also certainly helped me create a more inclusive and diverse team culture right here in this organization. I asked this question at a workshop that I was doing recently, and out of 102 individuals, only one person spoke Spanish, and it was actually someone from France. And he said, I never actually thought that my language skills and being able to speak Spanish was really relevant at all in this organization. But when his colleagues heard that he could speak Spanish, they said, oh my goodness, we can actually use your support in this stretch project on our capabilities that we're building in Mexico City. And he was like, my goodness. I had no idea this was a unique value proposition that I could share amongst my organization. Another example is if you've just completed the Leadership Pipeline program or a mentorship program. And when you're introducing yourself in a new organization or department, you can say something as simply as, hey, everyone, my name is Tomas. I recently completed the Bank of America mentorship program here. And I received an incredible amount of leadership skills and advice on navigating my career. I'd love to share this with someone who's interested in learning about what I learned in that mentorship program. How many people are here from Bank of America? Raise your hand. Yes. Thank you for being here. You're incredible supporters. And so after I've given you these examples, I really want you to start thinking about what is it that makes you unique? You think that because of your name, people assume you probably know Spanish. There are many of us that hold other unique value propositions. What are they? Does anybody here know American Sign Language? Raise your hand. Or say something, because I can't see because of the light. Nobody. Wow. That's interesting. I always have at least one. And if you're interested in learning a new skill set, which you should, I highly, highly recommend you beginning to learn American Sign Language because there are so many people with different abilities and learning disabilities as well as hearing disabilities that need our support in making sure that this is a more inclusive 
place to work. When you take control of your career, you have to first do an assessment. When you want to change the way that you see yourself evolving within an organization, the number one thing that you have to understand is what I've done currently and what I've brought to the table up until this point in my career. And so I want you to think of any certifications that you've recently completed over the last three years and ever in your career. What education or industry knowledge are you bringing to the table? Is this reflected on your LinkedIn profile, your volunteer bio, your executive bio, your resume, your internal talent profile? And when I talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about ethnicity and race. I'm talking about neurodiversity, diversity of thought, perspective, experience, language, communities, different countries and cities that you've lived in. You see, when I do presentations like this, I always get from organizations, Jai, before you start, I just want to say we're not a very diverse organization. And I stop them right there. Because when you ask enough and the right questions, every single person is diverse. Because when we talk about diversity, it's not just race and ethnicity. It's all of these other identities that we carry, as well as intersectionalities that we hold. And so I always make sure to, you know, have others understand that when we talk about diversity, they aren't left out because they're not a person of color, right? Every one of us is diverse. Think of ways in which you are diverse, and not just because of where you were born or where your parents or grandparents were born. Have you ever received an award or recognition? Do you know some technology programs and platforms like Trello, Asana, Slack, Miro? If you know those, you have to write those down. Because as you can imagine, not everyone has the skill set. Have you been given an opportunity to lead and manage others, even if it was just the summer intern or a fellow? making sure that you write down those opportunities and stretch projects so that you can start building your case on how are you the most unique candidate for this new opportunity. Once you understand what you've accomplished and achieved year to date, as well as throughout your entire career, and you've updated your resume, your LinkedIn, your internal talent profile, your executive bio, your volunteer bio. Step number two is understanding what new skill sets do I need to learn so that I can better position myself for the next best opportunity. If I want to be CTO or CMO or CDO or even CEO, which I hope you do, what are the certifications, the courses, the degrees, the conversations, the conferences, the panels, the podcasts that you have to be featured in as a subject matter expert so that you can position yourself for your next career move, whether it's at Toyota or at Bank of America or at PepsiCo. And if you have no idea where to begin on honing in on a new skill, here is a list from a survey that LinkedIn recently published. They asked thousands of organizations, when you are hiring new talent, please tell us what are some of the most important and valuable skill sets that your talent managers are looking for in individuals. The number one talent and skill is resilience and adaptability. Obviously, because of everything we've been through over the last three years, COVID, mental health, burnout, stress. The next one is, of course, digital fluency. They want to make sure that when they bring you on board, they don't have to do too much training around WebEx, Teams, Trello, Slack, Asana, all of these platforms that we have to build resources and resilience around understanding and pivoting to. My favorite is communication across remote teams, and most importantly, emotional intelligence. 
How many of you have taken a course on emotional intelligence? Raise your hand. Quite a few of you. Fantastic. I also want to give a shout out to so many of you who are watching from Merck Pharmaceuticals. I know that two weeks ago, you all took a session with Ellen Burtz Cooper on emotional intelligence. She is the subject matter expert. And a lot of you know that being able to hone in on not just your emotions, but others' emotions, and making sure that you still maintain the integrity of the difficult conversation you're having to eventually land on the goal is being emotionally intelligent. There's other skill sets that I want to challenge you on learning, and ones that I'll add as well. We have a couple of months until the end of the year. I want to really challenge you on making sure that you select two or three soft and hard skills to invest your energy, your time, and your money in learning. Because at the end of the day, if you're asking for these development opportunities and you're not receiving them, then it's your responsibility to making sure that you learn these new skill sets. Because you don't ever want to be in an opportunity or a position or a situation where you're up for a new role, you've been doing accounting for 16 years, but they're looking for someone who can manage accounting with digital fluency using this platform or program. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I didn't get the role because I didn't know that platform? And they got someone externally to fill the role that I've been doing for 16 years? It's always about evolving and honing in on new skill sets. One of my favorite ones is confident public speaking. How many of you have ever attended a Toastmasters session? Raise your hand. Fantastic. I had a public speaking coach for many years that helped me be a little bit more confident in the way that I'm delivering my message. There are also individuals out there that challenge themselves by attending Toastmasters, making sure that they hop on YouTube, open up a podcast, and learn through those routes as well. But at the end of the day, it's really your personal responsibility to making sure that you're managing your career advancement. Who here has ever hired a public speaking coach? Okay, I see one hand. Oh my goodness, I don't see any over here, just one. Fantastic. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to share and elaborate a little bit more about your challenges or your journey in professionally branding and communicating and articulating your career. So I hope that you all have a couple of questions in mind so that you can take control of how to change the narrative in your advancement. I want to share with you a small story, some of my personal challenges and limiting beliefs. You see, when I immigrated here from Dominican Republic and grew up basically in New York City, Washington Heights, and New Jersey, I started finding mentors when I entered the corporate workplace. I was actually really lucky in making sure that I had people around me within those workplaces that were guiding me, spending time with me, and advising me on how to write that email or sleep on it so that my emotions don't get the best of me, and making sure that I have the right people in my corner advising me on how to have those difficult conversations with my manager, because I've had many in my career. We talk a lot about authenticity, bringing your best self to work or your whole self to work. I think the more appropriate term is your best self to work. But you see, I was never able to really understand how to be my most authentic self when I entered the corporate workplace. Because every single opportunity that I had when I was really young entering corporate was always traditionally white, traditionally male, and it was a very certain type of culture. When I walked in with my bright red dress or my yellow dress and all of my Latinaness, I felt like a fish out of water. I was working on Wall Street, I was working in automotive, I was at Mercedes-Benz, and all of those organizations, 
I didn't see anyone that was as vibrant or as colorful or as Latina as I was. So for the first couple of weeks, I started feeling a little bit uncomfortable. People were challenging me and I was feeling that imposter syndrome of I wasn't looking the part of success that they were traditionally thinking. I wasn't sounding the part of success that they were traditionally and historically used to. And so really the people around me made me feel like I was a fraud, like I didn't know anything about the automotive industry. What does this girl know about finance and Wall Street and money? And once I really understood that I wasn't there to compare myself with an economist or someone in finance, I was here to be the subject matter expert in the Latinx and the Hispanic market, making sure that I was delivering research and studies on multicultural marketing so that our community that speaks Spanish and Portuguese is being thought of when these cars roll off the line. Making sure that when we impact our communities, with those financial products, it's in our language. And not just in our language, but it's the tone and the colors and the people and the images that are reflected in those brochures. That's where I was a subject matter expert. I started to feel extremely uncomfortable being my whole Latina authentic self. And so what I started to do was actually change myself to be able to fit in. I started telling people, no, 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 no me hables en español en el trabajo. Don't speak to me in Spanish. I just want to fit in. I want to look like them. I want to look like one of the boys. And so I started changing the way that I was showing up. I started blowing out my curly hair. I stopped wearing my red lipstick. I stopped wearing my bright pink and yellow and green and red dresses. And I started distancing myself from the Latino ERGs because I wanted to emulate the story of success that I was seeing in the corporate boardroom, that I was allowed to peek into every once in a while. And so I started changing the way that I was showing up. And for a while, it felt good. I was finally being invited to Capitol Grill with the boys. It was a good feeling. I felt like I belonged. But you know what didn't feel good? Every time I stepped out of those doors and into New York City, having conversations and creating programs for Latina professionals and women of color. I felt like a fraud then, when they would say, this isn't the same Jai that I met at that financial literacy program. This is the Jai that we want to see here in the Latina community. This is the Jai that brings the spark and the fire and the expertise to what women and Latinas need now. This is who we need as a champion for our community in there. And so I did a switch again. I think that we are allowed to evolve and pivot into our most best self. Sometimes it's not our whole self. But that triggered a lot of imposter syndrome and code switching, and it challenged the way that I was advocating for myself. Because when I felt like a fraud, and when I was comparing myself to the economists, I couldn't speak up. It was emotionally and physically challenging me. I wasn't confident in raising my hand and saying, no, 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 this product will be delivered to this community that I know in this way. Because there was so much emotional tax weighing on me. And if you're an ally and you're watching or you're here in person with us and you're wondering, how can I help a young Jai that's currently going through this, that doesn't see herself or himself or themselves in a position of power or confidence or success? How can I make sure that that individual is their best self at work and brings in their language and their culture and their food and their curly hair and their red dress and their traditions and their red lips? It's making sure that you as an ally you as an advocate to our community, the LGBTQ community, the disability community, all of our communities, the represented ones especially, are heard and thought of. If there's ever an opportunity for you to literally give up your seat on a panel, because the panel is entirely homogenous, that's what I want you to do. You need to be like, 
I'm sorry, time out. Why are there all people that look like one type on that panel? Here's an individual that has the expertise and the background and the ability to share on that panel. And they're an Afro-Latino and they're a queer Latina and it's a non-binary individual and it's a person with different abilities than ours. It's your opportunity, your privilege, and your challenge to be able to make sure that we are represented everywhere. And when we mean we, we don't mean just our community. It's all of our communities. Making sure that you practice equity, not always equality, because if you're giving someone the same exact opportunity in the workplace, it may not work for me because of my different abilities. It's making sure that you join other diverse conversations and other ERGs so that you can say, oh my goodness, there's somebody here who's hard of hearing or speaks a third language or a second language that can't keep up with the conversation. Now I know that I need to turn on closed captions every time I begin a meeting. That's being a more inclusive leader. And making sure that when you hear bias or discrimination in a conversation, you are an upstander, not a bystander. Not taking the back seat and being like, bueno, there was a vice president in the room, y él no dijo nada. So I'm not going to say anything because that person, it's probably their responsibility to say something to that person. Making sure that you don't call someone out in the moment, but call them in after the meeting and say, hey, what you said about Diana being deaf, I don't think a lot of us knew that. I know that you were well-intentioned and you wanted us to turn on closed captions and that's really important, but the way in which you shared that in the meeting, it didn't make me feel good for Diana. Making sure that you don't cancel people because you're assuming they had ill intent and they're making these microaggressions just to make you feel bad, no. That's not how we operate. We have to make sure that we use those moments that we think are really impactful and negative and turn them around for educational opportunities. I heard this my whole life, Jai, you're Dominican, you're Latina, but you're so professional. Oh my goodness, but you're dressed so well and your English is so great. How? All the other Dominicans aren't like you. You must be the, you're a different kind of Dominican though. But you were born here, right? No? Soy Dominicana de pura cepa, just like Sid, right? And it's not an opportunity for me to cancel that person, but to counsel them and say, there are so many Dominicans. My uncles and my cousins are black. I have nieces and nephews that have blonde hair and blue eyes. We are so diverse, and I'm so excited to introduce you to Mangu and Mofongo. Let's go to the Heights, and let's hang out. We'll go dance bachata, and I'll show you that this is what Dominicans look like all around the globe, right? It's not an opportunity and a position for us to say, oh my goodness, that person should know better. They said that to me in front of everyone on purpose. No, that's not who we are. We're better than that. And I wanna double tap into the code switching because I know many of us do it and it's absolutely okay for us to code switch. It's that opportunity that you have or you take to be a culture ad and not a culture fit. I don't want you to do what I did walking into corporate America and in finance and automotive and changing and forgetting your Latino-ness and your Latina-ness and being confident in showing up and sharing your traditional values and your food and your culture and your dances, right? Making sure that you don't throw on that suit and you Foot it, you fit in and you keep your head down and you're really humble because it's something that we heard. Calladita te ves mas bonita. Keep your head down. Don't challenge your manager. Don't ask for a raise. Be thankful you even have a job. You have benefits. How are you complaining? I heard that. I never like to assume that anyone else did in my community. I heard that growing up. But it's making sure that we break out of that and saying, no, no, no. I'm going to come in and my best self Maybe not my whole self, because there are parts of our personalities and our lives that maybe aren't suited for corporate America. Maybe we're not ready to disclose have we been evolving or transitioning. Maybe certain parts of our identities aren't ready 
for our workplace, and that's okay. They never have to be ready. I want to challenge you to understand how others perceive you. But first, we have to begin with understanding how you perceive yourself. And so throughout the next two days, I want you to write down three words or phrases that describe who you are as a professional. Are you a strategic thinker? Are you incredibly resourceful? Are you very talented in using technology? And the next step is asking your colleague or your manager. Hi, Diana. I'm working on my professional brand, and I was wondering, can you send me three words or phrases that would describe me as a professional by the end of the day? I'm working on my brand. I'm creating a strategy to take control of my career advancement. I'd love to get three words or phrases that you would use to describe me. The idea here and the opportunity is when you write your three words and phrases down, do they match those other words that you received from your colleagues? And if there's a very big disconnect, you have a challenge. It's now time to make sure that how you see yourself as a professional in the workplace is the same way that others are perceiving you. And every time that you raise your hand is an opportunity for you to say, hey everyone, you know, I love coding. I'm incredible at Excel. I know how to do VLOOKUPs. I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> I just always mention it because there's probably somebody in here that knows how to do that. But making sure that you tap into those words that you chose for yourself. Training other people to use those words when they're speaking about you in a room full of opportunities. How are you branding yourself? How do others perceive you, whether it's in person? And does that person match what we see online? Making sure that your title doesn't just say account executive at X company. That tells me nothing. Software developer. I have no idea what that even means. Tell me more. Javier is the hype man for the top automotive brands in the world, Toyota Motor North America. Verified storyteller and marketer, and an advocate for equity and inclusion. Jasmine loves nonprofit, SMB Talent Solutions. She's going to be giving a presentation later on as well. She's a CAN and ERG leader. She's involved with the Chicago Latinos 40 Under 40 and she's part of the CHCI and CLCF alumni. Making sure that the images resonate and tell someone how to feel when they land on your profile. Even if you don't post consistently or constantly, it's making sure that you resonate a feeling and a brand and an emotion. And if you have no idea where to even begin to talking about yourself, here's a formula that I've developed on how to talk about your story. When someone asks you, what do you do? You start all the way from the top, you as an industry professional. Well, with over 15 years in the oil and gas industry, I've worked in many IT roles with a focus on cloud computing and cybersecurity. And then we go deeper into what you exactly do at Chevron. Currently at Chevron, I lead the IT program strategy on cybersecurity. And then number three, the reason why I'm going to engage with you on LinkedIn, the most important paragraph that you'll have is what you're actually doing for the community and why I would care. I also sit on the Latinx and Energy Community Board locally in Houston, and I work specifically with young women of color, making sure that they enter this industry. And then last but not least, your call to action. Everyone needs to have a call to action. Whether you're selling Girl Scout cookies or fundraising for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And if you have no idea what your call to action is, it should always be to help your organization find more diverse people, individuals, to work there. If you or someone you know is interested in working with me at Chevron, please feel free to review and apply to our open roles. We are invested in building a workforce that's as diverse as our communities. And then you drop in the link 
to the Chevron LinkedIn job site. And if you have no idea where to begin even posting, I challenge you to focus on just three core topics. Post consistently, and when I mean consistently, I do not mean every day, unless you're posting about hacer and using our hashtag, please do. You're gonna win a book and something really great as well. And engage with your audience. What do you wanna be known for? If I'm assembling a panel discussion and I need diverse individuals to focus on Latinos and technology, do you come top of mind for me? What are you interested in teaching people? What do you want to be the subject matter expert in? And I have news for you, it has nothing to do with your organization. It's you as an individual with your own personal and professional brand. I want to see how you all manage your work life at Merck, at Toyota, at Chevron, at PepsiCo, at Bank of America, at Microsoft, at IBM. Making sure that when you're posting, it's from the perspective and experience that you are going through. And you just happen to be working there, right? And they are supporting you. When you add me on LinkedIn, I only post about community building, Latinas, women of color, diversity topics, and our achievements and accomplishments. You'll only see me posting about that. My brand is very specific. Here's an example of that post. I said, last week in Davos at the World Economic Forum, I had the unique opportunity to speak on how reskilling might lead to gender parity in the future of work. My fellow panelists has some incredible insights, ideas, and strategies to share. If you're interested in watching our panel, I will link the video below. Thank you to the female quotient, their team, and its incredible leader, Shelly Zalis, for the continued support. I tagged Acer, I tagged all of the other panelists and their organizations, and then I used hashtags. And when people began to comment, I was replying and engaging. If you're wondering to yourself, I'm posting, but nobody's engaging with me, that means you're not connected to the right people who care about what you're posting. That means you have to do a complete overhaul on who you're connected to. That means that your strategic networking online has to be refined. If you're interested in taking the next step and making sure that you challenge yourself, do something differently, invest your time, money, and energy, here are some resources that I use. A book, a podcast, how to communicate, influencing others, learning about gravitas, and of course, our Acer YouTube channel. I use Grammarly and Word of the Day. My favorite way of learning is obviously through podcasts because I have a crazy puppy at home with my fiance and I have to walk this dog quite a bit. And so every time I walk outside, even if it's raining or snowing, I turn on a podcast, making sure that I learn something new. I'm like, oh, cultural intelligence. What's this about? And now I want to take the opportunity. My colleagues are going to be right here on the aisles. I want you to come to the front of the room. My beautiful colleague, Ileana, is holding a microphone. And I want you to ask me any question on your professional brand, what challenges you may have, and how I can help you succeed in making sure that you're taking control of your career advancement. Somebody has to have a question. Yes, if you can make it up to the top here, Ileana has a microphone. She will walk just a little bit closer and you'll meet her. Welcome. Thank you. Just a question about the, um, the imposter syndrome you mentioned. Yes. So can you tell us or give us an example how you balance keeping your filters on and off, correct? So sometimes as Latinos we wanna you know, be very rushed or you know, express yourself. But either way, can you comment on that? You know, I mean, kind of being self-conscious and sometimes, hey, put your filters down a little bit, tap your, your brakes in some situations. Do you mean not being as passionate in your work? Not being as maybe as authentic as, as you might be <laughs> in some cases. Ah, okay, <laughs> your full Latino self, exactly, huh? Exactly. 
we have a very big challenge in making sure that we are bringing our true authentic self, our passion, our voices, our mannerisms, our energy. A lot of us have heard in the past, calm down, you're being loud, you have so much energy, you're so passionate, you're always using your hands. There is a very delicate balance with making sure that we're being authentic and being as vibrant as we are at home with our familia, but also making sure that we know our audience in corporate America and not distracting them with who we truly are. I challenge you to be a little bit more passionate and authentic, but not getting rid of all of what makes you beautifully Latino and unique. It is a very delicate balance, but I think once you get comfortable with your audience, they'll want to know more about you and who you are personally. And so I hope that you're bringing your full Latino self, at least with your traditions, your culture, your food, your dancing, and some of the opportunities are obviously through Hispanic Heritage Month. Pero ojalá pueda hacerlo. Yes, we have a question here. Ileana will meet you at the front of the room. Ah, do I take it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Deborah with Pepsi Go. Hi. Thank you for sharing. You're so poised. I love it. Um, I wanted to build on what he asked, and I have a story. I had a boss that asked me to stop speaking with my hands to see if it was possible. Not possible. It took me a <laughs> second. I was waving all over. Um, I wanted to build on that question. So some of the feedback that I've got um, has to do with articulation. Yes. Look at my hands go. Um, and um, one of my mentors what he said is that a Latino sometimes we want to overcompensate, right? And we want to be really make a point and try so hard that sometimes we end up repeating a lot, right? So some of the things that I've done is before I have to present or even before I have to have a conversation, I write down my points. But even sometimes I feel like I'm repeating and repeating. <laughs> so what are some um, ways that you think we can try to balance this and not try to overcompensate because of our Spanish or our language? Thank you for asking that. That is the power of making sure that you hire someone to help and coach you. When I worked with a public speaking coach, we practiced extensively. What is the message that you want to convey? What is the opportunity and the challenge? What are you asking for? Write down those three bullet points and practice them. Don't overcompensate. Sometimes we tend to ramble on because we're nervous about the situation or conversation, and then it makes it worse. It complicates the conversation. We feel as though we're being miscommunicating or being judged on how we're delivering the information. And so I think exactly what you said Writing down your talking points, making sure that you dwindle them down to just three that you want to make sure comes across the right way is super important. Laying out the conversation first. Here's what I think we should begin with. I'm going to share with you three of my accomplishments for this year. Here's the challenge that I'm having with other individuals within my department or organization. And then I want to talk about some opportunities and solutions on how I think we can accomplish these goals. How does that sound to you, right? And then pausing and being silent. Sometimes we think that being silent and pausing is nerve wracking. Sometimes it makes us extremely uncomfortable to wait for the other person to respond. But it's powerful because they have an opportunity to listen, to let it marinate, and then to understand and agree or disagree. And so there's great power in pause, in preparation, in poise, asking questions, and also videotaping yourself for really, really difficult conversations or presentations, making sure that you present in front of your phone and your camera, watch yourself back, see the mannerisms that you're doing, and then using some techniques like holding one of these or a pencil or your notebook so that it stops your hands from going up so much. A lot of people used to click pens, right? Or just holding the pens. It's making sure that you find those techniques that work with your body so that you can calm down, right? Or put them on your lap and making sure that you also work with a coach. If you need a public speaking coach, I know a great one. Thank you. 
Yes, a question right over here. We have a question from the virtual audience. Oh, perfect. How can I get a head start in regards to the proper communications and project tools that are a must-have? Via certification programs, getting a postgraduate degree, et cetera. Oh, fantastic. There are also coaches for that. I mentioned a couple of tools that I use. They are Trello, Slack, Asana, and Miro. I see you all writing down. Trello, Slack, Asana, Miro, Teams, OneNote. I know it's so much. And if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll actually send you some of those certification programs. We partner with a lot of organizations like SHIP, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, as well as other organizations like CHCI that have these certification programs that you can embark on. So if you connect with me, I will send you those programs, applications, and links. Hello, we have a question in the room. Hi, my name's Monica. I'm the one person in the room that raised their hand who's hired a coach. Ah, tell me for more. public speaking. And the reason that I'm saying that to you is because I've already connected with you on LinkedIn and made that sort of connection. So you get me. Here I am. Um, and Where do you work, Monica? I work at Google. Ah, fantastic. And um, the question I have for you is how do you handle pivot careers uh, in your own branding? Oh, I love that. Thank you for asking that. So many of us have been challenged most recently to do something different that inspires us, that taps into our passions and our purpose, and hopefully it delivers a profit. Sometimes we want to take a different route. Maybe you've been doing accounting for quite some time, and maybe you want to go into a completely different industry altogether. What's most important to do is to find an executive and career coach that has done just that that can literally show you how they pivoted from various industries. We're gonna be having a conversation tomorrow with a few individuals that have pivoted from entertainment to sports and media and nonprofit. It's making sure that you find a coach that actually has done this before, that can teach you the certifications, the career moves, the resources that you need to be able to make those jumps. Also strategically connecting with those individuals who are working in that organization or in that industry so that they can share with you the nuances, the subject matter experts, the VPs who are the decision makers, and also asking a lot of exploratory questions. Do you like your job? What does it entail? How long did you study for? Does it still fulfill your passions and purposes? Does it resonate? Is it flexible? Can you engage other parts of your brain? Are you creative in this space? Is it difficult to tap into? There are so many webinars on YouTube on pivoting more specifically into tech, but into other industries as well. Let me see if we have any more questions for any one of my colleagues. 